Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to have a very short um, but poignant conversation with the new Wink Fellow. It's uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation has a fellow as a fellowship in honor of Walter Wink and June Keener Wink that we award every year to an emerging faith and social justice leader. And uh, I'm very excited to be virtually here with our uh, newest Wink fellow, May Ye. And welcome, May. Thank you. It's good to be here. So I know we only have 15 minutes, so we'll keep it short. And I look forward to a much longer discussion and much more time getting to know you. But uh, just to start out, I want to frame this conversation um, around, um, I want to frame this conversation around the flagship campaign that the Fellowship of Reconciliation is building right now. And the campaign is to uh, reclaim the name of God, to, uh, and it's to confront and overcome uh, religious nationalism. We're specifically focusing on Christian nationalism because that's the dominant religion here in the US. But of course, uh, it's not only Christianity, it's, it's, really, it's mixing religion and the state. And I'm also really excited, uh, May, that you are our first non-Christian Wink Fellow. Um, and one of the things that excites me so much about working with you is uh, reclaiming Judaism is, is what I see as exactly um, what you're undertaking. So if you could uh, tell our audience a bit um, about what made you, we'll start with what made you decide to go to rabbinical school? Yeah. Um... People ask me that question all the time, and I've noticed over the years that I always have a different answer. Um, and for those who don't know, I was ordained as a rabbi on Sunday, and I've been able to breathe for the first time in six years um, because I was censored for five of those six years. And so in these past few days, I've been like, oh, there's no one over my head anymore. So as I think through the multitude of stories that I've had to pick and choose from to tell people, um, this feels like the first time I can just speak my truth and there's no one who's gonna tell me that I won't become a rabbi anymore because it happened. Um, Could you tell us I, a bit more about what, that, what, what you mean specifically about being uh, censored? Yeah, I mean, I was censored around being you know, I believe that it was around being an anti-Zionist, but the reason that I believe I personally was censored as an anti-Zionist, as opposed to my other peers and classmates who also share the same politic, is that I am Chinese American. And so I think um, when people don't fully believe that I'm Jewish because I don't quote look the right way it's much easier to say oh and you're also an anti-Semite because you're an anti-Zionist um so in any case I in at least some ways now I'm free from that specific um censorship and institutional institutional kind of like overseeing of how I move through the world um as for how did I get to rabbinical school why did I come to rabbinical school um, I think it was a pretty surprising story for myself, if not for those around me. I grew up in a secular home um, in a very tiny nuclear family. I am an only child and both of my parents are also only children. So holidays, whatever they were, kind of looked the same as any other day um, in my household. When I went to undergrad, um, well, let me back up for a second and say that I, I came to undergrad after a gap year. And that gap year is when I really started engaging with questions of who am I? And when I asked myself that question, one of the answers was, I'm half Chinese. This is something I've always known. I've always felt deeply and believed deeply about myself. And it was 
an identity that uh, my mother in particular really worked hard at forming in me. But when I said that out loud to myself, the question became, if you're half, what's the other half? And then I started to remember about how I knew that there was Judaism in my family. I knew that my grandfather was incarcerated at the concentration camp at Dachau. I knew the, the story of my tenacious grandmother getting him out of the camp. Um, I remembered growing up and like people pointing out the kitchen window at a house and being like, oh, Rabbi so-and-so lives there. And, um, you know, so there was like Jewish language that vaguely existed, but I never went to synagogue. Actually, we weren't allowed to as a family because the one time that my dad tried to go to the synagogue at the bottom of our street in Maine, people started screaming at him saying, traitor, traitor, traitor for his then um, positions on Palestine as, and advocating for a two-state solution back in those days um, and for advocating for Palestinian human rights. So when I say that I grew up in a secular home, I really grew up in a secular home. There were no holidays. We were not just high holiday Jews. We didn't do anything. Um, and so over the course of my gap year and moving into undergrad, I tried really hard to get involved in Judaism which means that I knocked on a lot of doors and none of those doors ever really opened for me because either I didn't look the way, right way and or I didn't have the right politics. But I'm stubborn and I kept knocking on that door as I moved throughout the course of my undergraduate career. And as I began to dream towards graduate school and thinking what I might do, I still was interested in Judaism and spirituality to be a part of my continuing education journey. At the time, I was a music major and getting involved um, more in social justice at the time. And I said to myself, well, maybe I'll do some sort of musical diplomacy work, conflict resolution using music in Palestine and Israel. Long story short, that led me to study a language that summer. I was debating between Hebrew and, and Arabic, and the Hebrew program ended up being closer to home. At the Hebrew program I went to, I looked up who the rabbi was, another door that I was knocking on. And I learned that that rabbi had gone to the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College. At this point in time, I was home in Maine over a break from school. And I remember clearly running upstairs to my parents and saying, hey, I could be a rabbi. And we all laughed because there is no world in which that wasn't a joke. It had to be a joke. The secular kid like who had no relationship to spirituality or religion was here saying, maybe I could be a rabbi. Days later, we were walking on the beach and I was walking ahead like a teenager on my phone and walked back to my parents and said, hey, so the school has a prospective student institute and they'll fly me out and they'll put me up and I can visit the school. And my parents were kind of confused and I myself was kind of confused, but we decided that I had nothing to lose. And so I ended up visiting the school on the day that Trump was elected as president. And I remember classes being canceled. And that meant a lot to me, that students had the choice of whether community at school was a place where they felt they needed to process and um, grieve and organize, or whether they needed to be at home and with different community that day. During my time at that prospective student institute, um, this is 2016, a bunch of the prospective students got together and said, hey, we all have plans to go out to Standing Rock very soon. Can we all do a tech study and learn together about the relationship between Judaism and land? And I was sold. And I was like, okay, I guess this is where I explore my Judaism. I guess this is the place where... Um, I continue to explore my music, my musical uh, talents and interests. Um, and maybe this is the place that I um, deepen my relationship um, to social justice. So in the end, this rabbinical school let in myself, a Chinese American anti-Zionist 
who from the beginning has felt very strongly that part of the reason that I wanted to become a rabbi is to be a voice for Palestinian liberation. I remember early on being in the streets for Palestine and people saying, but you're not a Jew. Mm. And they weren't actually saying you're not a Jew because you're an anti-Zionist and therefore you're an anti-Semite. There might've been a little bit of that there, but more of it was you're not a Jew because you're Chinese American and you don't look right. And maybe because you're a woman too. And so a lot of the journey was, all right, so let me get this title and then try to tell me in the streets that I'm not Jewish and I'll tell you that I'm a rabbi. And, um, you know, there, there are plenty of other reasons that I could that I could share um, about why rabbinical school, creating the places for people like myself who never had them. Um, I currently serve as the rabbi of Mending Minion, which is an explicitly anti-Zionist community in New Haven, Connecticut. And though we have a large number of young queer leftists, we also have a fair, a fairly large number of elders who come to me and say, this is the first time I've been able to re-engage with Judaism. I've been waiting my whole life to hear a rabbi offer the political framing that you offer. So that's the, the not so short um, story <laughs> of how I, how I got here. Since I know we're keeping this conversation short and leaving folks wanting more, um, which I certainly do, um, I want to ask one more question, kind of as, a, as an opening and um, as a follow-up on this. I know that uh, you host high holiday services uh, in the Palestine Museum. If you can um, explain how that came to be and what that, what that feels like um, to you both as a Chinese American, Jew and um, as a rabbi. Yeah, so if we throw back to, I want to say maybe it was 2018, maybe 2017, I was at the um, first Shabbaton of the Jewish Voice for Peace Havara Network. And I was sitting next to a wonderful person by the name of Ali who said to me, I belong to this budding community called Mending Minion in New Haven, Connecticut. And we're going to launch our community by hosting high holiday services, by hosting Rosh Hashanah in the Palestine Museum in Woodbridge, Connecticut. Can you come lead services for us? Unfortunately, I had to say no at the time because I was the rabbinic intern at Sedek Chicago with Rabbi Brant Rosen, the first explicitly anti-Zionist synagogue in the country. But last year, um, after some years off to account for um, the pandemic and needing to be outside, uh, we, were, we were back in the space. I remember being at an event at the Palestine Museum and the founder of the museum comes to me and said, when is Mending Minion coming back to the museum and using our space? When are you doing high holidays here? And so that's very important to me that we are invited and asked to be in the space and asked to practice our Judaism that is in alignment with, with Palestinian liberation. And and we wrestle with what that means and how to do that, especially in Yom Kippur, our, our day of atonement. What does it mean for us to this past year pray the same penitentiary prayers that Israeli settlers are praying while blocking entrances to Palestine? What does it mean for us as Jews to pray these prayers while people are sitting facing portraits of Razan, the nurse who was murdered during the Great March of Return, while, while facing the portrait um, of Shireen, the journalist who was recently murdered. What does it mean to surround ourselves by the images of these Palestinian martyrs while we pray? So it becomes a time in which we really wrestle with our responsibility. Um, as Jews, while also not trying to lose kind of the spiritual groundedness of the holidays. And so it's always an interesting challenge for me to, you know, hold the political significance of being in that space while also crafting a deeply spiritual service that's not, um, you know, completely taken over by politics. Thank you. So, um... I just want to say as we wind down um, 
that you know we're we're awarded we awarded you with this fellowship to support you in your first year officially as a rabbi and to help you make connections and um, give financial support. And I want to say that that we benefit probably more because the opportunity for myself. Um, who also grew up entirely secular, the opportunity to witness your growth as you walk into um, your practice as a rabbi and as, and as an anti-Zionist, as somebody of principle, um, I will say, reclaiming the name of God uh, in the most spiritual and important way is such a gift. Uh, to me and to my colleagues. So welcome. I know we'll have more conversations and that our audience will, our supporters, folks, yeah, FOR people will have an opportunity to get to know you better and um, yeah, and learn from you. And I look forward to high holidays next year with you, or this year, this year with you in the Palestine Museum. Thank you. I'm so happy and honored to be the newest link fellow. So Chris, you can go ahead and turn off Facebook Live if you want, and we have either all or